Morning, church. Morning. It's good to be with you this week. We have had a couple of weeks of phenomenal speakers, and so uh, I feel like I'm a little rusty uh, being out for almost a month of preaching, as it were. But I thank the elders for the opportunity to sit where you sit and be taught and be edified, even uh, as most recently. I was so amazed with Brother Paul Baker. What an amazing job that young man does. I asked him, why do you need to go to school? Uh, he's already doing a phenomenal job, but we look forward to uh, seeing his great increase in the fruit that will come from his work. Would you pray with me? Holy Father, as we bow before thee this hour, we pray that so far our uh, spirit and truth worship has been acceptable. It has been a sweet savor before thee. And Heavenly Father, we ask that you continue to be with us and help us to keep our minds focused this hour to the message that has been prepared, and ultimately, Father, I ask that you would be with me as I speak these words, uh, that they would be in accordance with thy will, Father. Uh, Heavenly Father, bless us this hour as we continue to worship thee in the study of thy word. We pray in Christ's holy and perfect name. Amen. Amen. There's reminders all around us that we need to be remembering certain events, certain people, certain times in history, the great sacrifices that have been made on our behalf, the luxuries, the comforts, the freedoms that we have today. We have them because of great people that even sit with us today that we know as veterans. We think about these visions that were before us, the remembrance of the Holocaust, the remembrance of Bosnia, the remembrance of Vietnam. So many things we see on a daily basis, and they serve a purpose to cause us to remember. Some of the things that we remember are not so good. Some of the things are good. And we should be reminded as we see various monuments that there is such a thing as the past. And there are sacrifices that have been made on our behalf. As it relates to the text that Jaime read for us, it is the case that Peter, even prior to his death, revealed there in that passage before he was done reading, Jesus had showed him a death that would be coming his way. And he said, I will endeavor that ye, brethren, those of the great dispersion, those that he was writing to, that you may be able after my death, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Think of those things that he just taught. They knew about patience and love and kindness and gentleness. They knew those things. And he reminded them, if these things be in you and abound, you'll never be barren, but nothing but fruitful. He said, there's a great place called heaven. Your great reward is ahead of you. Don't forget what's been done on your behalf. And so it's interesting, as he would make this statement to this audience, he uses the word endeavor. Endeavor was used just a few verses earlier. I will give diligence, right? This is the same word. I will give diligence, study, to show thyself approved, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. You recognize the word? Diligence. I will give diligence to always put you in remembrance. Ephesians 4 and verse 3. Endeavoring, that very first word that's used there by Paul, same word. So please understand the force of this particular statement. He says, I will be spent. I will spend. I will do everything in my power to cause you to remember even after I'm gone. 
And so as you think about remembrance this morning, we are constantly reminded to remember. You begin in Genesis 1 and you end at Revelation 22, and you see over and again that God calls on us, his offspring, to remember the great accomplishments that are in this great book recorded for our admonition. He does that in several ways. And now that I've completed the lesson, I've already thought of a few other ways. <laughs> so this is, this is just a thumbnail. Uh, but bear with me as we go through these points uh, because it is important that we recognize these monuments. First of all, as you go back to the beginning, as Jesus often did in his teachings, remember that he has offered us tokens that we might be reminded to remember by. You go back to Genesis chapter 9, and certainly you're familiar with where we are already. I know you're ahead of me. Slow down. Don't get ahead of me. The Bible tells us, I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. Continuing, he says, and God said, this is the token. Here it is. A token is a signal. It's a beacon. It's an evidence. It's a flag. It's a monument. And so when we see the bow that is in the sky, we understand what it means because we're familiar with Genesis chapter 9. We understand that it is a monument so that when the bow is in the sky, it is a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And so when we see the monument in the sky, when we take our pictures and post them, look at what I just saw in my backyard, we're therefore causing others to remember the token of God's covenant between him and all of the earth. And then a little further in verse 16, and the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant. Isn't that neat? He gives us a monument in the sky. He gives us that standard, that flag in the sky that causes us to go back to the very beginning, back to when the, the imaginations of the, and the thoughts of mankind were so very evil that he destroyed all but eight souls. Causes us to remember that day, that event, and certainly this covenant. And so we're called to remember, even when you see this token in the sky. Further, we link about the chapter number 17, circumcision. Circumcision, the Bible says, was a token. It was a monument. It was a flag. It was a symbol of God's covenant between me and you. Now, if you think about that just for a moment and the power of that symbol, maybe it helps us to understand just a little bit the Jews' standpoint as we come forward into the New Testament. This is a powerful monument established even from Abraham's day, and so we understand that when they were saying you must be circumcised, and baptism's good too, you have to understand where they were coming from. This was God's monument, a token. And so they remembered the, the covenant as well. Just a thought. Also, as you look into the Old Testament, you see in Exodus chapter 12, the blood over the doors, remember? The blood that is over the doors, remember? We've taught our kids. We have shared in VBSs. We talk about it often. It is is a token for God. And so when you see the blood, he would pass over. When you see the blood, then how much more powerful is the cross? And so think about the various tokens that are used even in the Old Testament. Those signs, those signals, those monuments. It is a powerful thought indeed. God wants us to remember. Also, there are specific days that God has offered up. 
days that cause us to remember specifically a point or an event in time. In Exodus chapter 20, please remember, he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And he goes on to tell them about six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Now, as you go forward from Sinai and you look into the great law of God, we're going to be reminded that there are a multiplicity of days that actually cause a man to remember. You might remember out of these that are listed before you, and for those that are listening online, we'll read them for you. There is the Day of Atonement. There is the Feast of Tabernacles. There is the Feast of Weeks. There is the New Moon Celebration, the Year of Jubilee. There is Passover. There is the Feast of Purim. And there is the Feast of Trumpets. And please remember that three of these, the men, not to exclude the women, but specifically the men, must attend three times a year. You must be to these three every single year. And so there was that journey into Jer Jerusalem on a regular basis. This is where we find ourselves with the crucifixion, the day of Pentecost specifically, right? These particular feasts, the Passover, and then certainly Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. And so there are days that cause us to remember, and for, for them specifically, when they look back to the Feast of Tabernacles, you remember? This was to remind them of their wilderness wanderings in the 40 years that they spent in tents as a sojourning people. The Feast of Weeks, the great harvest celebration, the Passover we just showed you out of the book of Exodus. They would remember what took place the night that they fled after eating that meal fully dressed, fully packed, ready to go. You remember? They would remember that. And so there are monuments in the Bible as days that cause us to remember. Come forth into the New Testament. You come forth into the New Testament, Acts chapter 20 and verse number 7, and notice the significant point in time now is the first day of the week when they came here to take of the dinner, the communion, the feast, the memorial, the first day of the week. And it is terribly important because there are several things that God accomplished on the first day. And He wants us upon the first day of the week to remember all of those, I would suggest. Certainly the sacrifice, as we just partook. There was the resurrection recorded in Luke 24. There was the great appearance in John chapter 20. You would remember Thomas missed that first, that first appearance. But there was the appearance of Christ. There was the ascension in Acts chapter 1. And also there was the arrival of the Spirit, Acts chapter 2, beginning at the top of the chapter. All these things happened on the first day of the week. They are significant. God wants us to remember the first day of the week. And by all means, most of Christendom understands that, don't they? I mean, there's buildings all around our neighborhood today that are filled with people because they understand the gravity. They understand the nature of the first day of the week. So the first day causes us to remember, causes our minds to go back. And I put this out there for you to marinate on. I like to marinate on things from time to time. I can't prove anything. But if all of these events were so very important and God made sure that it happened on the first day of the week, wouldn't it be beautiful if he came back on the first day of the week? What an appropriate time. As saints are gathered, praising and adoring him, if he were to appear in the sky today. I get chills thinking about that. What a beautiful thought that would be if he came back on the first day of the week. There is a significance then in the first day of the week as it relates to the judgment and us looking forward to that day. Notice in Mark chapter 13 and verse 32, Mark records of that day and of that hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. And so I would ask us all, are we remembering that that day is still out there? Because there's passages like 2 Peter 3 and verse 11 says, what matter of man ought you to be, knowing that these things are on the way? As Revelation ends, Lord, come quickly. Let us not forget that that day is out there. There are days of significance that cause us to 
remember over and again. 2 Peter 3 and verse 12, Peter writes, looking for and hasting unto the coming of that, the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. This was spoken nearly 2,000 years ago, recorded by the apostle on parchment for your benefit. <laughs> Let us not forget that that day is out there. There's a very important day of remembrance to each one of us that have their names written in the book of life. Another thing that pops up throughout the book is this idea of monuments. There are monuments that have been set up throughout God's holy writ that are to remind us. And so let's begin even back in Genesis 19. Now through this one in there, here's another one of those marinating moments. And I hope y'all will marinate on this a little bit. But the Bible tells us in Genesis 19 and verse 26 that Lot's wife was turned to a pillar of salt. Pillar is the word used by the Holy Spirit. Pillar is what? Substantial. It's supportive. It's something that's hard, right? Now, I know on the other side of that, there's salt. Salt melts. You know, it, it dissolves with the rain, etc. So I don't want to try to confuse anybody, but in my little old peanut brain, I'm thinking as Jesus reaches back in Luke 17 and verse 32 and says, remember Lot's wife? I just wonder if maybe he didn't see that monument. That would be a monument, wouldn't it, of remembrance? God said, don't look back. She did. Can't make all the necessary points, but looking back to see if maybe family was coming, Hope they made it out. Maybe looking back in admiration of the city that she loved so much. Don't look back on those earthly things. Maybe that's the monument that we need to be thinking about from time to time. So maybe that would be a monument. But specifically, I know of one. And you go over to Joshua chapter 4, and you're probably there already. As you pass over this great Jordan, notice that he commanded them. You take up these stones upon your shoulder. What does that tell you? Big stones, right? It's not a couple of little rocks. These have to be carried on the shoulder. We often talk in terms of this when we talk about stoning. Why do you think that Saul was holding all those tunics? because it was going to take some effort to reach down and get one of these stones and pick it up and drop it on a man's head. Stones, giant boulders here that are picked up out of the midst of Jordan and carried over and continuing that these stones would be set up as a sign, a monument, even suggested by the literal language there, a monument among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean ye by these stones? Right? There is a remembrance. Verse 24, continuing, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord that is mighty, that you might fear the Lord your God forever. Not that she had necessarily seen the monument, but the idea was certainly what Rahab possessed, because if you go back a few chapters, verses 9 through 11, remember she talked about the, the God that destroyed the Moab, that destroyed the Ammonites, remember the, the fear, she said our whole city has melted. That's the thought process that would come to all that saw that particular monument. So here's another one of those great examples that God has set monuments out before us, even for the people of the land that would see that to remember his greatness. Again, in the same book, do you remember Achan? You remember the, the Valley of Achor? Remember that moment in time? This great heap of stones was set up as a memorial over Achan. Remember the great tragedy that befell him? because he coveted that which he found and tried to keep it for himself. Covetousness is sin. 
lying to God and others is a sin. All those things would be a remembrance to us, to any who would pass by in that particular valley and see that monument that was set up, causing us to think back and to remember even such a horrible day. Also, there are acts of devotion that you see throughout the Bible that are great reminders, great memorials, great signs that should encourage us and cause our minds to go in a certain direction. I'm thinking of Mark 14 and verse number 3. The Bible says, "...in being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he, Jesus, sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head." Verily I say unto you, wheresoever the gospel shall be preached throughout the world, the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of her for a memorial of her. And so as you think about the anointing of the body, even prior to death, you think about the great sacrifice on her part and the many other bullet points that we could list even beyond that. We're still talking about it today. The great memorial of this young devoted lady. And so as we think about her and what she did, Jesus said it is a memorial for all of us. John chapter 13, not so much explicitly stated, but think about the love that you show. It is a sign of your discipleship. Even in this particular passage, understand that others will know that you are a Christian by the love that you have one for another. Because the Bible says, by this monument, inserted by me, by this expression, this flag, this designation of agape love, they will know who you are. You're a monument. You thought about that? The Bible says in 1 Peter 2 and verse, five, verse number 5 that we are lively stones built up. I'm getting chills. What about you? You are a monument. You're that great reflector. You're the light of the world, the salt of the earth. You're reflecting the agape love of, of God. And so others will know who you are if, in fact, you're that monument. Also, I think about forecasted events. And we'll end here if you're taking notes or whatever, but when you think about God's foreknowledge, remember the test of a prophet found in the Deuteronomy record, those things that do come to pass certainly prove that he is a true prophet of God. God never lies. And when God says that the thing is going to come to pass, it does. And these should remind us of certain truths like God never lies. I mean, God always keeps his promises, even those great promises that we were reminded of a few moments ago by Brad. You see, forecasted events are those things that help us to remember, especially a certain day. In Matthew 26, we share this verse so many times around the Lord's table. We are reminded of this great monument. Beginning in verse 26, Matthew records by inspiration, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave thanks, or he blessed it and break it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now, if I was sitting at that table, I might have thought about the moment in time that John records over in John chapter 6. It was just shortly after this particular passage that the Bible says about verse 66 of that passage that many of his disciples stopped following him that day. <laughs> But he told them, you will eat my body and you will drink my blood. 
And so here, as he breaks this Passover feast with them, and he shares this, and he breaks the bread, and he divides the cup, he sends the cup down, as it were. He took the cup, and he blessed it. He gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, the new covenant, which is shed for many for or unto the remission of sins. This is the looking forward of what the blood would accomplish. All those that we have recorded in Hebrews 11 that died in faith, as it were, the blood cleansed them. Those that have not even been born yet, upon their obedience, the blood will cleanse them too. That's the power of this blood that's being mentioned. And so he says it is shed for the remission of sins. Please notice, men, as we pray, he did not use the word spilt. Spilt is an accident. Let us not use that word anymore in our prayers, please. His blood was not spilt. His blood was shed, and he did it voluntarily. He did that for you, and he did that for me. This was the foreknowledge of God. This was a foreordained act. Remember the passage we're in in study in the, in the mornings, Revelation 13 and 8? The Lamb of God slain from the foundation of time. This was the foreknowledge of God. And so going forward, notice this great event, this moment in time. He says he's looking forward to a day. He said, I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He said, I will build my kingdom. Remember what he told Peter? So many of our friends today in the world insist that the kingdom hadn't come yet. Jesus was taken by surprise. They killed him. No, that was forecasted too. Remember Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, so many of those passages that you know so well. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse number 16, we understand that the blood is communion with Christ. And the body, this is what we do in the kingdom. His royal subjects, his peculiar people, those that are in the Lamb's book of life, those are the individuals that partake of this great feast. It is fellowship that we have with Him, even according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 10. And then you go to chapter number 11, again, that we read so many times at this particular point of our worship, and he has the opportunity, Paul does, to quote Jesus. And so notice this great memorial. He says, this do in remembrance of me. So many of the tables that you see in the brotherhood today have something like that on the front of it. Because this we do, remembering him. And so when you think about this feast, the men that stand before you and urge you to center your minds on the cross, we need to remember what was accomplished on our behalf. We need to remember that he didn't die at the scourging pole like most people did. But he got up from that scourging pole having lost untelling how much blood. It's no surprise that he fell under the weight of that big cross piece. It's no surprise that he was physically weak, but it didn't stop him. He continued to march straight to Calvary. This do in remembrance of me, he says. Perhaps the greatest monument in the entire Bible, the sacrifice of Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. And so we close with this thought that has everything to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, as Paul is working on closing his letter down now, he has dealt with uh, quite a few problems that the congregation of Christ had there. And as he reminds them, he says, I declare unto you the gospel. That de word declare is the idea of make known, and maybe some of your translations bear that out. 
I make known, I declare unto you. I've not hid anything from you. I have not shunned to proclaim unto you the entire God, counsel of God. He says, I made known unto you, Church of Christ at Corinth, Christians, the gospel, the euangelion, the good news that was heralded, which I preached unto you. And I would suggest to you that in his mind is the same focus that you see in 2 Timothy 4.2. Reproving, rebuking, exhorting with all longsuffering and doctrine, teaching. He taught them the gospel. The gospel that they had received. Reception is the idea of obedience. Reception is hearing it, understanding it, and then understanding, I must obey it in order to go to heaven. And so reception is like the good heart of Luke chapter 8. Those that receive the word and bear fruit. Some a little, some a lot. So they received what he declared, the gospel. They received it and they were standing in it. Steadfastness, rooted in Christ. So that when the storms of life come, you'll not be moved. Remember the man that built his house on the rock? All of us are going to face the storms of life. But are you rooted? If you're standing in the gospel, you're ready for the storm. And so he says you've received it, you've obeyed it, you are standing in it, your steadfastness, your patience, your continuance in the gospel, and you are saved by the gospel. Loved ones, family, friends, in accordance with Ephesians 4 and verse 15, let me say this with all the love I can, if you have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, you are lost. That is, you are outside of the kingdom of Christ. The Bible says in Ephesians 1 and verse 3 that all blessings are inside of Christ. Galatians 3.27 in beginning tells us that getting into Christ, putting on Christ, coming into that safe location is through baptism. That's why 1 Peter 3.21 says that's where you're saved. So please hear the loving gospel. The Corinthians did, and he commends them for that decision. But notice again the importance of remembering to those that were steadfast, that were saved, that were obedient. Made some mistakes along the way. That's the, the past of the book. Notice if you keep in remembrance what I've spoken to you. And then he goes on to remind them of what he spoke unto them. He said, unless you have believed in vain, for I delivered, I declared, I preached unto you, first of all, that which I also received. And I just wonder for a moment if his head didn't go right back to Damascus as Ananias was sent by God Almighty to preach to him the gospel of peace. And upon preaching that message, he asked him, why tarriest thou? What are you waiting on? Arise and be baptized, washing away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And he did. He tells us about that over in Acts 22, about verse 16. He tells us that he received the gospel, standing in the gospel, saved by the gospel, even Paul himself. I just wonder if that was where his head was at the moment he wrote that. Looking back to the faithful Ananias that would come and preach to him, as scared as Ananias was, he still did exactly what the Spirit bid him to do. And he continues, and he says, How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. Please remember our thought. The monument of forecasted events. He's reminding us of the great monument that God has set up from the foundation of time. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Isn't it amazing then how Isaiah had the privilege of talking about the suffering Savior, that same passage where the eunuch was reading and ultimately had the gospel preached to him out of that passage and was saved after he was baptized? 
according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Friends, when we think about the Gospel, it is a monument all of its own. And it should remind us of a plethora of things. It should remind us of the love of God. Romans 5 and verse number 8 and 9, saving us even ultimately from the wrath of Jehovah God. That which was done for the whole world. John 3 and verse number 16. I want to start right there next week. I hope you'll be here next week as we talk about the gospel message. If you're with us today and you have not been obedient unto the gospel of Jesus Christ, let me rehearse very quickly things that you need to be reminded of. The Bible says very plainly in John chapter 8, in verse number 24, that if you do not believe in Christ Jesus, you shall die in your sins. And maybe say, well, I believe in Jesus. Right on. We're heading in the right direction. The Bible also says that we must confess the name Right? Matthew 10, Romans 10. And it has to come from a pure heart. One that is contrite, understanding I have offended the creator of the universe. The Bible also says I have to repent of my sins. I've got to walk away from the old man. Crucified with Christ. Galatians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 3. Mortify. Put that old man to death. Leave him behind because he's not going to help you get to heaven. Walk away from the old. Put on the new. But the Bible says really the place where it starts is immersion for the remission of sins. And so if you have not been immersed for the forgiveness of your sins, you say, well, I was baptized at six over here in this church over yonder. And, you know, well, let's talk about that. I'd like to show you the authority of God and what he has to say about scriptural baptism. You want to talk about that today? We can. But that's where it begins. And so when you read uh, phenomenal passages, like 1 Corinthians 15, 58, always abounding in the work of the Lord, that is the idea of faithful unto death, Revelation 2, 10. Faithful all the days of your life. You're going to make some mistakes along the way? Yeah, even Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. But I expect to see Paul when we all go to heaven. Have you obeyed the gospel? Please allow me to remind you that Jesus Christ came for you and for me. And to not pay attention to that sacrifice, to say and utter words like, I'm fine, I'm good. Me and God, we got an understanding. That's blasphemy. Don't utter those words. Because until you put on Christ, there's no blessings. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Please be reminded of the monuments. The monuments are important. The monuments are there from the foundation of time. And they should be important to us as we think about the day that's ahead of me. I don't know what's going to happen to me today. I might be hit, be hit with an aneurysm and die. What about you? Do you know what tomorrow is holding for you? You don't. If you need to put Christ on today in immersion, let's do that. The water's ready, the clothing is ready, the personnel is ready. If you understand you need to at least talk about it. Man, I'll skip lunch. Let's go talk about it these elders, these deacons, members of this congregation would love to see you change your mind today. Maybe, maybe you're one of those that's already done that. You've already put on Christ, but you realize I have failed in my life as a Christian. Or I've got this particular problem. Our elders would love to pray with you, for you, with you, we would love to fix that problem today because there's nothing more important than being right with God right now. We can help you with any of that. Express that now while together we stand and while we sing.